The ground rules for today's debate are quite simple, starting with Terry Mulder. Both politicians uh, have six minutes to make their opening remarks. Uh, I'll give each of them uh, a, an indication when they have a, a minute, one minute remaining. Uh, then we'll throw open the debate to questions from uh, journalists here today uh, who must identify themselves and their employer. Questions should be short and to the point. We don't want any speeches today. And then before we wrap up the debate uh, in about an hour or so, both politicians will uh, have three minutes for their closing remarks, starting with Jill Hennessy. So would you please welcome uh, our two politicians to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, Terry Mulder and Jill Hennessy. Thanks for being with us. And uh, we'll start with you, Terry. You can have the opening salvo uh, from the Transport Minister in caretaker mode. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. And, uh, to Mark and uh, all members of the press club, journalists who are here today, thank you for coming along. This is a very, very important debate, very, very important issue uh, for the state of Victoria. You have no doubt had a look at the financial reports today, uh, a fantastic budget position and a great budget position going forward. We came to government, we prepared the budget, we made sure we had the money in place, the dollars to invest, to, to invest in public transport and to invest in our road projects uh, going forward. We've got a growing population, we've got a growing uh, freight task, we've got uh, a growing number of people who want to travel on our public transport network and we have to address those issues as a government going forward. We believe we've got the plan and we believe we've set the, uh, the pace in terms of what we've been able to do to improve the public transport network since we gained the government. Uh, punctuality has improved dramatically across the network. Overcrowding has come down. Customer satisfaction has gone up. Obviously, the, the people who use our public transport network are saying to us as a government, we appreciate what you're doing, but we just want you to do more. Um, I believe the customers who use the network are the best uh, gauge and the best judges as to how a government of the day is performing, and that's the message that we are, we are receiving back from them. There are a couple of myths floating about in terms of what we've done. Uh, punctuality. Uh, you've achieved that by skipping stations. Can I tell you, there's about 2,350 train services run each day. Uh, train uh, skipping stations run at about seven. Uh, we're running, at, as I speak right at this moment, 95% punctuality we're tracking for this particular month. If you take, say, 0.35% off that, you'll understand that we've achieved a lot in terms of improving punctuality. Uh, we've, we've added time into the timetables to help Metro. More people are getting on and off trains and the, and the timetables have to reflect that. More people are travelling on, uh, in wheelchairs, on buggies. We have to have a timetable that reflects that. We've had a couple of minutes to deal with that issue and we've got a timetable that reflects how long it takes to load and to unload uh, passengers. We've halved overcrowding on the network. So we've actually set the scene to now start building. And the projects that we've announced, particularly in the area of public transport, are about building for the future. The Cranbourne Dan uh, Dandenong Pakenham Corridor project, two to $2.5 billion. One in 10 people use that corridor. When I turned up as a minister, I was told that it won't be long before people are turned away from those train stations. They will not get on because there's no room to put them on. We put in place some temporary measures. Uh, we altered the layout of the trains to fit more people in. We added some peak hour service. We added some shoulder peak services, but not enough. We have to upgrade that corridor and we've committed the money through an unsolicited bid to do it. Two to $2.5 billion. Melbourne's inner core has to be fixed. And we've announced a project called the Melbourne Rail Link that incorporates an airport rail link. We have moved away from the original Metro project and our move has been supported by Sir Rod Eddington who actually developed the Melbourne Metro. It's about separating the metropolitan rail lines out and giving Melbourne what they want and that's a link to Melbourne Airport. We can achieve that within the same budget envelope that was allocated to Melbourne Metro but we'll move a lot more people uh, in doing it. We must continue to make the investment, 10,000 additional train, tram and bus services since we came to government, but it has to be a balanced approach. We will build the East-West Link. The East-West Link was supported by the former <coughs> Labor Brumby government. It was supported by Labor members of the western suburbs. We will build the East-West Link and we will build the western section of the East-West Link. A $2 billion commitment by the state government 
gives us a $6.8 billion project. We have to widen the Tullamarine Freeway. We've got 30 million passenger movements there at the moment. By mid-2030, it'll be 60 million. We have to widen the Tullamarine Freeway. $1.1 billion project. Our commitment to that has been $50 million. We've got great value and we've been able to negotiate great outcomes right across the network. Sitting still is not an option. These projects have to be delivered right across the network. On top of the projects we deliver, we've got to continue with service delivery. We've added 10,000 additional train, tram and bus services into the network since we came to government. And most importantly, we've established Public Transport Victoria, an independent statutory authority to run our public transport network for us. I make sure that the people who are involved in the business with me, the operators, the CEOs, face the music with me if there's anything wrong. They face the music with me if things are right, but they face the music if anything is wrong. And I know the journalists in this room will know and understand that you have had ready and easy access to each and every one of them. Whether it's Theo Tafelis at Beeline, whether it's been Ian Dobbs, Mark Wilde at Public Transport Victoria, uh, whether it's the new CEO down at VicTrac, if you want access to the people who actually deliver the service on a day to day, it's never been like this before, but it's certainly like it since I've been the Minister, you can have open and ready access to them and you can discuss issues in relation to service delivery and the role they're undertaking to deliver the best possible outcome for the people here uh, in Victoria. It is a different approach. It's an approach that works. You'll see John Merritt uh, out there doing radio programs, taking questions from people in the public about our road infrastructure as well. It's important that we're open, that we're honest, that we're transparent, and there's nothing covered up. And I can assure you, in terms of my role as the Minister for Public Transport, that has been happening since I took over this role. Exciting time in front of us a state that's going forward, but most importantly, a state that's got the money in its back pocket to pay for the projects. You can rave all of the transport plans in the world you like, you've got to have the money to pay. And this government has fixed the budget. We are the envy of every other state and territory in Australia and our federal colleagues because we've done the hard work, we've got the money to take it forward. Thanks, Thank Terry. Uh, time's up now, it's uh, your turn now, Jill. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Well, it won't surprise you that I spend a lot of my time on um, Melbourne and Victorian train stations talking to people about public transport. And it's a terrific way to learn and observe and be reminded again and again why public transport really matters. Um, it's far better than party political polling because I get to look in the eyes of people when their bus doesn't connect with their train when their train whizzes by their station and it doesn't connect. And if there's one thing that I continue to observe and learn, it's that commuters are being beaten down into accepting poor service. And in a sense, I think it is becoming <coughs> emblematic of public transport in this state. Um, and that's what I see and hear most mornings. Uh, that's to say nothing of uh, the thousands of people uh, who don't actually consider public transport a viable option and resort to driving on a road. Yes, even the poor people, despite what Joe Hockey might have you believe. But our city is growing, public transport is struggling, our roads are becoming more congested, and it's a vicious cycle that is sending our system backwards. And my uh, contention against the government is that the Liberal government have shown no determination to break that cycle. And addressing that cycle will cost money, but not fixing these issues will cost a lot more in the long run. And one thing is for sure, digging an $18 billion tunnel uh, won't fix much, and it definitely won't address the needs of the commuters that I speak to on a regular basis. Now, there are two particular issues that are part of the core of the problem, and together, these are holding our public transport system back. Uh, one of those is level crossings that clog up our streets and our roads. The other is the grind in the city loop that slows our trains to a crawl. And the choice for Victorians is how to address these problems uh, could not, in my view, be clearer. There is Labor's plan to remove 50 of our most dangerous and level crossings and to double the size of the city loop. 
and there's the Liberals' plan for an $18 billion tunnel that won't do enough to fight congestion. On Saturday, Tony Abbott, God bless his soul, declared that this state election was going to be a referendum on the Liberals' $18 billion tunnel. Well, if that's the case, he's picked a debate with more than a political party. He is picking a fight with the thousands and thousands and thousands of Victorian people who want a better public transport system. We'll be helping those people send a message to our Prime Minister. They know, having cut funds from almost every public transport project in Australia and proudly claiming that rail is not their gig, uh, that, that there needs to be significant investment. They will send that message. And Dennis Snapfine and this government have stood shoulder to shoulder with the Prime Minister. They have been smug in their disregard for what people want, but very lavish when it comes to spending taxpayers' dollars on their mythical projects. The Liberals want us to forget the litany of broken transport promises. They've compromised their own authority by breaking so many of the commitments they made before the last election so spectacularly. But you can't cover up broken promises on rolling stock and building new rail lines because they have not been built. But this time, I'm hopeful that Victorians won't let them get away with it. They'll see a Liberal government who is now stumbling around in a fit of panic after being twisted in procrastination for four years. Labor's vision is very clear. We will get out of the cycle that we are stuck in by building Melbourne Metro Rail, by doubling the size of the city loop, by building new stations, opening up our university and our health precincts, opening the door for more trains, more passengers, more services, a true metro system where commuters can just turn up and go. And with a guaranteed $2 billion in road funding for outer suburban and regional roads, we'll make them safer, we'll get them moving and we will patch up the Liberal cuts. We won't waste your money on fake ads, fake newspapers, faux boarding farces for imaginary projects. Our plans will be dictated by Victoria's priorities, not by Victoria's politics because governments can come and go, but our long-term transport priorities will always remain. And that's why we'll establish an independent body to advise on the projects we need, not those that our politics demand. We'll invest almost 900 million in new trains for Metro and V-Line, and we'll build them here in Victoria to create more jobs. We won't proceed with Dennis Napthine's botched public transport rail scheme that cuts off Frankston from the Flinders Street our plan for Melbourne Metro will actually take trains into the heart of Melbourne. A world-class city deserves a world-class public transport system. Regional Victoria deserves regular services that they can rely upon, and everyone deserves safer roads. I'm proud of our plans to build Mernda Rail, to introduce 24-hour public transport on weekends, to increase services for regional Victoria, to remove 50 of our most dangerous and congested level crossings, to double the size of the city loop, and we've got more to come. But a good public transport system fundamentally makes a difference in people's lives. Only a Labor government will put people first. Public transport will be uh, an incredible priority for a future and incoming Labor government. We've been very clear about not making pie-in-the-sky promises. We are only making commitments to projects that we say will make a fundamental difference. And we want to change the governance structure to stop the you say tomato, I say tomato every election time when it comes to significant, important infrastructure projects. I look forward to our conversation and debate today. Thank you very much for having me and for the delightful lunch. Um, and um, I'm sure we'll flesh out some of more issues as we have uh, as we take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. And uh, we're throwing it open now <coughs> to questions. And uh, I might start by asking Terry. Um, there's a, a widely held view that for Melbourne to be considered a truly international city, uh, you know, on the world scale, we need a rail link to the airport. Mm. We do need a rail link to the airport. Uh, I walked at Kokoda Track years ago and got on a, a train and stepped out at Brisbane and walked about 100 metres up to a, uh, a motel and walked inside and I thought, how good is this and how far behind are we as a city? As we indicated, we're going to have massive increase, increases in uh, traffic volumes along the Tullamarine Freeway. Uh, toll, 
um, and a number of other major warehouses are establishing out around the Melbourne airport and there's another four in the planning that's going to put f further pressure on the Tullamarine freeway. 30 million people at the moment going through the airport, 60 million by the uh, mid-2030s. We will not cope, uh, people will not get there. It'll be a real disincentive to come to Melbourne and to do business unless we build an airport rail link. And the good thing about our Melbourne rail link, airport rail link project, we do it in the same budget envelope as what the Melbourne Metro proposed by the former Labor government. Um, a 10-minute frequency, a uh, 25-minute trip uh, from Southern Cross Station. We've already uh, got the route in place. The alignment is there. The reservations are there. We're having discussions with Melbourne Airport, and it's something we just simply have to do. For anyone to turn their back on an airport rail link and think that you can double the throughput of Melbourne Airport uh, in, by the mid-2030s and do it with road-based transport needs to have a good, long, hard think because it will not happen. And really, anybody who lives anywhere around Victoria, anywhere around Victoria, our call is if you get to a train station, you'll get to the airport and you'll get back out again. Now, the Melbourne Airport make a lot of money out of parking and they know that they're going to be in trouble going forward as well. And they are supporting the Victorian Coalition Government in bringing a train station and a train service to Melbourne Airport. It has to happen if we're going to protect our reputation as the world's most livable city, as the world's friendliest city, and deal with the issue of traffic congestion on the Tullamarine, even with the widening. That'll buy us time. But an airport rail link is something we simply have to have. Your view on that, Jill? Look, I don't think anyone argues that a rail link to the airport is a bad thing. Um, the question is when, and the question is how you set your priorities. Uh, and it's Labor's view that building the Melbourne Metro, uh, Melbourne Metro is the critical first priority to put more capacity for our train system at the centre. The second observation I'd make is that we've heard promises from the government before about building rail links, and Doncaster is an example of those. When you go to the Victorian budget papers and you look at the time frame uh, for which the government has made this promise, you see the pro project plan you know, cruising off the phase at year 2026. Um, yet this is a government that funded with our taxes people handing out fake tickets to the airport rail link down around Spencer Street Station. We're about focusing on the priorities that, that can change the transport outcomes for the services that people use every day. We want to build capacity in the centre um, and a link to the airport will come once we have that capacity. Peter, can I point out, we have $830 million in our budget for Melbourne Rail Link and Melbourne Airport Rail Link. There is no money in Labor's commitment or even Melbourne Metro, even to start construction on Melbourne Metro. There is no money committed. We are committed, we will build it, we know it's necessary and our budget position is that strong that the community know we can build it and we will build it. I think it's uh, obvious that um, the plan for the Melbourne Rail Link uh, from the airport was part of the Balti government uh, mm. initiative yeah. as well way back then. Uh, any other questions uh, from the floor at the moment? Hi, uh, I'm Harry Weijers from Transnet, um, uh, involved in the buses here in um, uh, Melbourne. Uh, I think that uh, public transport is more than only trains. Uh, buses are the feeding system for, uh, for trains and our public transport system here in Melbourne. Uh, we're facing more and more customer aggression and it uh, doesn't uh, help the safety for our drivers, doesn't help patronage, doesn't help growth and customer satisfaction. Uh, what will you do to help us with that problem in our bus system? Can we start with you, Jill? Uh, yes, well, Labor's, I'm, I'm really aware of some of the challenges that drivers have been encountering. Um, Labor will be releasing their bus policy uh, quite soon uh, as well. This is one of the issues as well that will be addressed uh, in our bus policy. But um, long story short, we're committed to working with the bus industry to look at what are the safety improvements realistically that could be introduced. Yeah, look, look, I've been interstate and I, I must admit I saw something and I thought, please don't say we're going to go down this pathway in Victoria, but it may get that way with cages around drivers. I've seen it in other states. Uh, I've seen it in other capital cities and I thought it would be a shame if we have to go down that pathway to separate aggressive people, people who are under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Uh, it's, it's a very small number of people within the community, but it does cause a problem and, and we are aware of that. Um, now, as I say, we've been having discussions with the... Uh, 
the uh, bus industry and having uh, around putting additional security into some of the buses on some of the routes where we know the problems occur. It's not across the board. It's certainly in certain areas and on certain routes where these problems do occur and we're more than happy to continue that discussion. But if it gets to having to put a cage scenario in place to separate a driver from uh, passengers, then we may have to look at that on some of the routes. As we do with the taxi industry, whether they decide they want to put a screen in around them when they drive, some drivers may feel that they need to have a screen separating them from customers. But as I say, I would hate to think that's going to be the case, but given what we face today with people out there under the influence of drugs and alcohol, it may well have to happen on some routes. Ken? Yeah, thanks, Mitch. Uh, Ken Davis from the Clifton Group. Um, we're opening an office down in Geelong, and I, in recent weeks, talking to the locals down there, they're all asking me and discussing uh, about a Geelong-driven freight passenger transport strategy uh, for the next 25 years. Uh, and uh, when I was coming up today, they said, oh, if you get a chance, could you ask both of them? So uh, on behalf of the, uh, the good denizens of, uh, of Geelong, the, uh, the freight passenger transport strategy. Uh, I would say the, the people in Geelong, the best uh, freight transport strategy we could possibly give them would be the east-west link, including the western section of the east-west link, to give people who are moving freight in and out of the southwest and in and out of Geelong a, uh, an option other than having to try and tackle the Westgate Bridge each and every time they come to Melbourne. All we need is a, a truck broken down, a taxi with its bonnet up in the air, and we know we've got significant problems. Uh, we've been having uh, discussions with, uh, with Avalon Airport uh, in terms of uh, developing some freight hubs in and around Avalon Airport. They're very, very keen to establish a freight business out of Avalon Airport. Uh, the Coalition Government and other ministers in particular uh, have been working on that. We haven't got to a conclusion, but certainly we're working very, very closely with them because we understand their passenger business is down to about five flights a day each way. We said that we would work with Avalon Airport to put an airport rail link in there. They've said to us now it's no longer an immediate issue for them. They've moved it out to a medium long-term project until they can build more capacity um, into their airport. But a number of those people have, have approached me uh, wanting to set up a hub um, in Geelong. They're concerned about freight costs getting in and out of Geelong naturally. Um, we've put in place a process for high capacity freight vehicles on duplicated highways. It wasn't in place when we came to government, which enables a lot of those freight operators now to pull two 40-foot containers rather than a 40 and a 20-foot container. We believe that that's provided a great advantage for those particularly who are packing grain um, out of Geelong. But as I say, uh, it's an ongoing issue. We're continually having discussions with them but they're very, very keen to get, as I say, some form of a freight hub up, up and running. But uh, the people who've approached us, and I'm sure the same people who've approached you are private individuals who own land in and around Tullamarine and they're in negotiations with, with Lynn Fox at the moment. So I'm not really in a position to divulge some of that negotiation that's been taking place. Jill? I am, um, you know, I am aware that there's um, a broad request around a, a, a study, um, and I'm not in a position here today to come and make an election announcement about Labor funding the sorts of work um, that that would involve. Uh, certainly, I'd make a, a couple of points. Um, we're very proud of what our contribution is to regional rail. Um, Labor, of course, delivered regional fast rail. We delivered the regional rail project. Uh, we were first out of the blocks on committing to 20-minute uh, passenger services off-peak on V-Line. Um, we've also made a commitment uh, to have Infrastructure Victoria make an assessment about the best place for a future port siting. Um, I think many of the freight issues will come with that, uh, but I would imagine that as the Port of Hastings um, versus the Bay West option, as that is independently assessed, uh, that many of those freight issues would be engaged in such an assessment. Um, I'm not the freight spokesperson um, in, for Labor. Natalie uh, Hutchins is our, our Shadow Minister for Freight. Uh, but I would, um, if uh, Victorians do us the honour of electing us on the 29th of November, um, I'd be certainly looking to try and progress that project um, with Infrastructure Victoria as there's an assessment done for future port sightings. A comment on that, uh, Peter, just quickly. The, um the issue in terms of fast rail that was mentioned just reminded me, an $80 million commitment by the former Labor government that blew out to $850 million and the regional rail link project announced 
uh, with no money for trains, no money for grade separations, no money for land acquisitions, no money for signalling, and the whole project had to be halted, pulled back in, rescoped, delivered a year ahead of time and $900 million under budget by coalition government. Well, um, Peter, I can't let Lovely that go unchallenged either. Uh, <laughs> certainly, um, if you don't believe Terry or me, believe the Auditor-General, and it was Victoria's Auditor-General that was highly critical of the Victorian government for refusing uh, to let these claims on the regional rail project uh, be assessed. Um, furthermore, more generally on the development of regional uh, network development plans, the Auditor-General has also been extremely critical um, of the Liberal government in regard to their failure to uh, deliver and release a regional network development plan as well. So um, whilst we might take um, a couple of polite pot shots here Go at each it. other, um, <laughs> I'd also direct you to have a look at the fine work that Victoria Auditor General has done on these matters. We have a question up the back here, sir. Have you got one? Did you have one or would you? Yeah. Well, Labor has been very clear in setting out its priorities um, and we have said that we will not build East-West Link. Um, I suspect you and I might um, you know, not find that intersecting part of the Venn diagram on this issue. Uh, Labor has committed to building the Westgate distributor uh, as well and um, you know, we simply say it is about priorities and it is about choices and those are the choices that we are giving um, the Victorian public to make on the 29th of November. If you said to me what keeps you awake at night, it, it would be the thought of a, a major failure with the Westgate Bridge, not just a, a truck or a, or a taxi with its bonnet up, but a major failure that caused the bridge to be shut down for an extended period of time. Where would we go? I mean, what would that do to Melbourne? What would it do to our reputation? What would it do to productivity? What would it do to the freight industry? What would it do about people trying to get to and from work, people out of Geelong and people out of the western suburbs? It would be an absolute disaster. And we shouldn't, I used to be a quality assurance consultant, we shouldn't have a situation where we're sitting there with a risk we know exists and not doing anything about it. We need to build a second crossing. We have to build a second crossing. It was supported wholeheartedly by the former Labor government. You said you it was supported it. by Jill. It was you supported, supported by you said all you of her people. Build it, Terry. And then they turned around the minute they got a sniff of the Greens in the inner suburbs. Oh, that's not Can I just true. talk that about the Westgate distributor? Not true. Let Victorians Can decide. I talk to you about the Westgate distributor, their answer to problems with trucks? in the western suburbs. Going to start next year, about two years of environmental work to be done on that site to start off with, number one. Number two, they're going to toll 5,000 trucks. According to the Port of Melbourne report, the maximum number of trucks that come from the Westgate area is about 2,000 trucks. So where does the rest of the money come to pay for the Westgate distributor? Because it was supposed to be paid out of tolling 5,000 trucks. And quite clearly, that's not going to be the case. Well, um, you know, I would challenge all of those assertions. Uh, Terry has relied upon uh, the advice of Rod Eddington uh, in some of his arguments here today. Rod Eddington, of course, uh, is the person from whom, uh, who designed the concept of the Westgate distributor in the first place. Um, we're very confident in the capability and uh, the business case for the Westgate distributor. Um, it's a project that is going to start next year, not in 10 years, um, and we're, we stand behind it very confidently. Uh, and we have had a taste of what could happen when uh, we lost the signals in the city link tunnels. That was a mm. sort of taste of what can happen around Melbourne mm. when that sort of thing occurs. Uh, we have a question over here. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Murray Collins from VACC. Uh, Victoria is the only state in Australia that doesn't allow motorists to pay their vehicle registration, their rego, by instalments. All the other states do. Will the next uh, government uh, commit to this to allow motorists to stagger their payments? Because we all know when we receive our rego bill, we have to pay in one huge hit. Uh, given motorists and businesses the bottom line, the back pocket is under stress at the moment. Mm. Is this a commitment either of the next parties as, as the new government will make? 
You know, he's trying to throw me to the sharks when he offers <laughs> me up first. Um, look, you know, I don't want to disappoint you. Um, it is something that I will raise with our shadow minister for roads. It's outside my portfolio. Um, Terry might be in a very mm. good position to tell us um, what the hit on the budget um, might be for such a proposal. Um, we do do it for things like council rates to stagger how things are paid. I will raise that with our shadow minister for roads and if I get your contact details, I'm happy to come back to you. Terry. Thank you. Um, Mikey has a little brother and it's called Randall. And Randall was the brainchild of the former Labor government, which was a new IT system for Vic Roads that was supposed to do all of those wonderful things for us. <clears throat> and I took over that project when I took up, up as minister. It's had about $100 million gone into it. And we were told initially there were six change requests in terms of contract variations to get this project, <coughs> pardon me, on its way. Um, those 16 turned into hundreds, absolutely hundreds. We went back and looked at the business case. It wasn't the business case, it was information that was fed into the business case that was flawed. That project has had to have been stalled until we look at a whole of government approach as to how people do business with government and pay government, whether it's a fishing licence, whether it's any other form of payment, land tax, whatever, and whether or not we should have a look at an overall project for payment to government. Now, the work that's been undertaken up to this point in time with the Randall system, we may be able to salvage some of that to go into that process, but that was going to be the catalyst to allow us to do a whole host of different things with the way people pay their registration, uh, pay their licensing, do an awful lot of the transactions online, and unfortunately, it's just another IT project on top of Mikey that I inherited and this one simply had to be stalled because it looked like there was no end in sight for it. We have been exploring the options of whether or not there are any other mechanisms available to government to offer people a choice of a quarterly or a half yearly payment, um, but at this particular point in time, uh, we don't have a resolution on that. Peter, I mean, this is a government that um, really likes to always put the focus and blame the previous government. It's like mm -hmm. they want us to forget that they have actually been in government for four years. Mm. And it, it, it is quite a forgettable four years, I will grant them that. Um, but the issue is um, you have your opportunity to address it, and I think it's a bit rich to stand up here uh, and to try and take a retrospective and then kind of jump True. us to the present and wipe out the last four years like it is an etch-a-sketch. Um, I'm not in a position to talk about the technical details and so, you know, I'm, I, I'm not going to contest what Terry has to say about that. But I do think um, the political avoidance strategy has, is one of the reasons why this government has been seen as not doing enough. Okay, we have a question from Brian. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. Brian Negus from RACV. Uh, to both, uh, both of our uh, speakers, uh, I want to raise the issue of clearways, uh, really because we see those both in terms of road congestion, but especially you know, tram and bus congestion on our roads as well, especially along tram routes. Uh, as to what the, uh, the two speakers, the, the candidates as it were, uh, have to say about clearways in Melbourne, particularly uh, extended hours of clearways on tram routes and bus routes but also 24-7 clearways in quite a few of our major, major roads like Punt Road. Mm -hmm. And maybe if I may, a second question, just to give our rural folk a bit of a look in. Uh, the Shepparton Bypass, Jill, I realise you're in the public transport space, but uh, we've seen a lot of commitments in, in major infrastructure in Melbourne and quite a few in regional Victoria as well. Uh, the Shepparton Bypass has been on the books for some time and is one which uh, I'd like to really hear about from, uh, from both parties. Mm -hmm. You're getting to the bottom of the list now, Brian, aren't you? Because there's an awful lot of those projects that have been on your list for a long time and the coalition government have been working through them one after another after another um, and we have been delivering those projects. As you recall, uh, there was an approach to clearways, a blanket approach to clearways that was applied by the uh, former Labor government. It caused a great deal of angst, particularly to the business community, particularly to strip shopping centres and uh, we didn't believe that that was the right approach. Now, I know that one of the RACV's big issues has been Punt Road. Uh, Vic Roads own a lot of the properties along Punt Road and they've been securing those properties over a long period of time to add an additional lane into Punt Road. We've conducted a fairly intensive uh, investigation into Punt Road and what we've come up with is that you can put an extra lane into the existing reservation, run a contra lane flow, move the cars off the road into the properties that we own and create off-street parking. That gives a fantastic outcome for the people 
who go up and down Punt Road on a day-to-day -day basis. That means no parking along Punt Road, but no massive investment by the government in terms of using the properties we already own, uh, own to get the cars off the road. My office worked very closely with Vic Roads to get that project up. We've announced it. Uh, we're going to do it. Uh, there's even an opportunity we might even be able to see some of the activity in coming weeks because we're looking at perhaps gravelling some of those vacant blocks along there and starting to move cars off the road as quickly as is possible. It's a sensible solution. We see contra lane flows on other roads around Melbourne. They do work, giving three lanes of traffic coming out in the morning and three lanes going back home at, at night. It's a good solution, it's a sensible solution and it's a low cost solution. We also have a group working with us at the moment looking at other locations uh, around Melbourne as to where similar type of outcomes may be able to be achieved. We don't want to blanket. Uh, when you blanket, you cause too much disruption and too much angst, particularly to small shopping centre owners. But that was the approach of the previous government. Ours is different and Punt Road tells the story. And Shepparton Bypass, did you? Um, look, uh, it's one of those projects that has been mooted. I know there's an announcement recently made by the Minister for Regional Rural Development uh, in relation to the Echuca Bridge proposal, 93 million, wanting a, a commitment from the, uh, from the federal government as well. But in terms of regional Victoria, I mean, $200 million plus for rail standardisation, Princess Highway East, Princess Highway West. There's a huge amount of money going into the, into the regions as well. So we'll keep it in mind. I haven't got a commitment to make today, but I know it's getting down to the bottom of your list, Brian, because we have been delivering a lot of RACV projects. And Jill, would you care to comment on those or not? Um, oh, look, I mean, just department? on the issue of on road priority, um, you know, we're obviously happy to work sensibly and collaboratively with communities, um, your organisation, Brian, in government. But what we're not going to do from opposition without the detail, without the data, um, make silly commitments around those sorts of issues and potentially, you know, bite off our nose to spite our face and to create problems. But we will bring um, an open mind and a collaborative spirit on those sorts of issues. Um, Shepherd and Bypass, um, I'm just, I'm simply not able to talk about it. It's outside my portfolio, but happy to raise it with our um, Shadow Minister for Roads. Sir. Uh, thank you, Co uh, Councillor Glenn Goodfellow from the City of Wyndham and the Transport Spokesman. I have a two-part question for both the Minister and the Shadow Minister. The first part deals with roads. Uh, notwithstanding the huge and legitimate focus on public transport, let's not forget that around 90 per cent of travel occurs on our roads in the outer suburbs are hugely dependent on a good road network. The recent Auditor General's report on transport infrastructure uh, backlogs identified $5 billion worth of upgrading arterial roads in the outer suburbs and approximately 1.5 billion of that is in Wyndham alone. So what plans do you have to systematically fund a continuing program with duplicating arterial roads in the outer growth suburbs to address this backlog? And the second part of my question relates to the bus services. The major form of transport in the outer suburbs, the, the, go the government in the last budget announced plans to improve bus services in Wyndham to coincide with the opening of the regional rail link stations. Will Labor commit to implementing these service programs if they win office and with the population of Wyndham growing at around 3,000 households or 12,000 people per annum, what plans do you have for the coming bus reviews and implementation? Would you like me to have a crack first, yep. Jill? Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I would have to say that uh, Wyndham has never had the level of attention that it's getting at the moment uh, from uh, government uh, of the past. We have actually trebled the number of bus services uh, in Wyndham. Uh, we've, uh, we've realigned bus timetables uh, with train timetables. Uh, the regional rail link is being delivered a year ahead of time. They'll have Wyndham Vale Station, they'll have Tarnit Station, and included in our budget is money for additional bus services to link with the train timetables. Now, I know that there's pressure on for roads and I know we've done, uh, we've announced Snides Road interchange, Minister Guy announced that for Wyndham and I know Wyndham would like additional roads uh, built out there in terms of their arterial road network and, and duplications. But can I say this, my overall aim and goal is in those regions, is to get as many people off the roads, onto buses, taking direct routes to railway stations to get to work. At Springvale Station, 40% of people now arrive by bus. If we continue to make the investment that we have, there's around about 7,000 additional bus services per week 
that we've put in since we come to government, link those with train timetables, get our punctuality right, we will get people onto buses. Where we put those additional services into Wyndham, there's been a massive uplift in patronage on the bus network, a massive uplift, and we believe that will continue. To me, that has to be the answer. I know you'd like us to announce four or five other major road projects, but you get Wyndham Vale Station, you get Tarnit Station, Williams Landing, which will intervene to make sure that it had ramps for people with a disability. It wasn't going to have ramps to it, and we've trebled the number of bus services. Wyndham has been the biggest winner of any municipality in Victoria in terms of additional bus services rolled into it. Um, thanks, Peter. Just a, a, a couple of um, facts. Regional Rail, which delivered um, both Tarnit and Wyndham Vale stations, Labor, Labor project. Uh, so uh, Williams Landing Railway Station, Labor project. Mm, uh, so I'm certainly not going to accept um, the Liberal government taking responsibility for those important investments because they were very important investments that the previous Labor government made. On the issue of um, local roads funding, we think it is a very important issue. That's why we have committed a billion dollars to an outer suburban roads fund. That is a floor, not a ceiling. Um, the feedback that we constantly get is that we need certainty in um, the funding stream. We need to stop the ups and downs in the funding stream, and that is the purpose of our commitment to that outer suburban roads fund. On the issue of buses, our bus policy is coming. Um, I would also make the point um, that Wyndham also suffered from bus cuts to certain communities uh, as well, and um, some from Wyndham and certainly people in my community who campaigned long and hard in order to uh, achieve a reinstatement of those bus services as well. So when we talk about new bus services being introduced, what we need to also be very conscious of is that we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. The Auditor General was right when he uh, identified the transport inequalities in the growth areas out in Melbourne. Um, they will be um, an important focus of the bus policy that we announce before the next state election. Uh, oh yes, go ahead. Uh, Graham Curry from Monash University. Uh, congratulate you both on supporting rail capacity improvements of whatever sort. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, most people in Melbourne don't live uh, in the inner areas and don't travel to the city and very rarely travel to the airport. Mm. They live in middle and outer suburbs where their only public transport is a bus. Mm. And now, um, you did say you've increased services, but your own data shows the kilometres of buses every year have been very static in your government while population's grown immensely. Uh, I mean, what are your plans for increasing bus services into the future? It seems like both parties haven't really said anything about this. Yeah, this is the core of the electorate, um, and I'd like to understand more about what you propose. Um, in relation to those outer areas, as you understand, we've committed $700 million to Mernda Rail, which is a cost of building it. Uh, Labor are going to give a four to $600 million version. I don't know what you're going to get for four to $600 million, but yeah. that's their a commitment rail line to, to it. That's what you get. Uh, cra uh, pa uh, Pakenham, Cranbourne, Dandenong Corridor, a major upgrade out into those regions as well. The kilometres you talk about, and we know the problem why people wouldn't ride on buses, and you would know this, Graham. But they get taken on a whirlwind tour every morning, anywhere except where they want to get directly to. So what we've been doing through this process, we've been straightening out the routes. And as we've been straightening out the routes, we've been saving kilometres. And as we've been saving kilometres, we've been adding additional routes back in, getting the absolute maximum value for our dollar. That's what we've been doing. And where we've been doing that, more people are climbing on board buses. Now, there was a massive uh, change to our our bus timetables, when we change contractors. But from the number of changes that occurred, for a very, very small number of complaints that we had, and Transdev worked very, very quickly with us to reinstate a couple of those services. But there were hundreds of services that had been altered, modified, and the community are voting with their feet. It's not a matter necessarily of every time of adding additional kilometres. It's what you do with the kilometres that you've got. And I believe you me, I used to run a very, very marginal business years ago, a very marginal business, and I'm pretty mean and lean, and I make sure with the infrastructure we've got, we get the best value out of our dollar. Can I tell you, when I walked through the door, everything was about an additional $50 million. Everything was about how much more money can we have for a project. Can I tell you the difference now with Public Transport Victoria? This is what we've saved. This is a, a really worthwhile project. 
and this is what we believe we should do with that money we've saved. That's the biggest difference that has occurred since I took over as a minister to the position we're in today. We're sweating every single ounce of taxpayers' dollar out of every project and every service that we can to get better value for money. I certainly agree um, with one thing that Terry said, uh, and that is that you know direct and frequent routes are incredibly important for the purposes of getting people to use buses uh, as well. Um, what the minister didn't talk about was the bus tracker program. What he didn't talk about was the community outcry in places like Doncaster and Sanctuary Lakes because we've failed to engage communities about why we change and how we change. Um, Labor will be releasing our bus policy before the next election. All of the questions that you've raised will be addressed in that policy. I'm sorry um, that I'm not prepared to give you a, you know, the short version uh, today, but um, some people back at head office would get very grumpy with me if I did. So um, we'll Which certainly have some be, more Jill? answers. Again, people back at head office would get very grumpy some with me if I told you that. We'll just say uh, sometime between now you. and November uh, absolutely. 29. Absolutely. Well, you know, there's 18 days to go. You'll know. <laughs> Next question. Uh, Susie Batten, uh, sorry to take it back to Geelong and just a really quick question. Just wondering what the future is for Avalon Airport as far as you can predict. Yeah. Um, as you know, uh, prior to the last election, we went and had a discussion with Avalon Airport. They had two issues. Number one we raised was the rail connection. The other issue was aviation fuel. Uh, they used to drive from Avalon down to Melbourne and bring their aviation fuel back, even though an aviation fuel pipeline went straight through their property. Uh, so we agreed to provide some financial assistance for them to tap that line uh, to be able to drive, pull down their costs even further and to assist them with their business. The other issue we said we'd like to uh, uh, put a rail link uh, into Avalon Airport. At that particular time they had growing numbers. There were growing numbers there. And uh, since then, a passenger lights out of there have dropped, I think, five a day. Uh, they recognise to build a heavy rail line into there today would not be money well spent, but we've still gone ahead uh, with the reservation, with the planning scheme amendments, and when they get their numbers up, we'll be in a position to put a rail link in. It is not a, an expensive project because you've got both standard and broad gauge rail lines go straight past the front. Look, uh, we're working with them, not just from my portfolio area, uh, but Business Victoria are working with them, Re State and Regional Development are working with them to see whether they can actually uh, incorporate some other business activities in that parcel of land that they have. Now, they've got international uh, status in terms of uh, airline. We pushed and pushed and pushed to the federal government to get that. They're well positioned, they're pretty well structured, but can I tell you, from the minute we made that announcement, Melbourne Airport unleashed the biggest level of investment into their facilities you've ever seen. $447 million this year, I think $700 million next year. I believe they looked at Avalon as a potential threat and it shook them and they have responded and responded in an incredible way. But I still believe, if you have a look at Sydney, the difficulty they have with a curfewed airport to have two international airport status, uh, both cur curfew free, protected in that manner, is one of the best investments we can make as a government going forward. I shall speak cautiously because I speak beyond my portfolio on Avalon. I don't think there's anyone that wants to see Avalon fail. Uh, I don't think, you know, I don't think that any government wants to see Avalon fail and we know what pressure the aviation industry um, is currently under. Um, and so I think that what is the role for government in it, um, I don't think that it will be the issue of infrastructure by itself that saves Avalon Airport. I think it is about business development and working out what are the best business cases to run um, in you know, an economic climate where the aviation industry is under such extraordinary pressure. Um, I have every confidence that a future Labor government, if we were elected, um, would work tirelessly for the purposes of trying to ensure that we keep Avalon alive and a going concern. Um, the Geelong region has suffered brutally from so many, uh, so many shutdowns and closures, uh, and I think that you know, the, the focus absolutely would be there. Um, but I do think the future of Avalon, um, the role of government is not determinative in that. I do think that it is largely about the economic climate and what's happening in the aviation industry. We have a question over there. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Jane Waldock from the city of Yarra. Um, 
I'm in ah, is that better? Can you hear me now? Um, I'm wondering what um, projects you both agree on could be implemented by Infrastructure Victoria if the Labour Party are successful, or perhaps an equivalent public service uh, recommendation if matters continue as they are, Minister Mulder. What projects do you both agree on that would transcend the next election cycle so that we could see some continuity and some assurance on deliverables in the transport area? Well, we, we, we both agreed uh, overwhelmingly on, on east-west link and a second crossing for Melbourne. And no, you Yarra didn't. You don't agree with us now. Labor don't agree with us. And we're the only ones you going forward with it. You said you weren't going to build it. Doesn't sound yeah. like agreement yeah. to me. Um, it can like I, being sorry home. to disappoint <laughs> you so early. Can I tell you what? People elect governments to make decisions. People elect governments to get on and do things, and that's what we're going to do. Infrastructure Victoria, uh, an animal of the, uh, of the future Labor government, what will they do? They'll stack it with all of their cronies. That's the first thing they'll do. They'll hand them over the East-West Link contract and they'll ask for a positive response. That's what they'll do. Uh, that's what that organisation is about. We don't need them. We've got competent ministers. We've got a good budget. We've got a good treasurer. We've got the money to build the projects and we've got good bureaucracy around us to make sure that our projects are well scoped and we've proven that time and time again with what we're delivering. A new railway station at Warren Ponds. When I walked through the door, $40.2 million delivered for less than $25 million. We built a railway station at Epson in 14 weeks. Our people are getting very, very good at it. And we've got right through Public Victoria, Public Transport Victoria, they've inserted people from the private sector right through that organisation. And they have turned the public service on its ear. They are very competent commercial thinkers, negotiators and operators. We do not need Infrastructure Victoria, Infrastructure, then you've got Infrastructure Australia, who on earth is going to make decisions? I mean, we are a government. We're elected by the people of Victoria to make decisions and we're making them. Well, well let's just have a look for a moment where we actually have significant investment um, in heavy rail and transport projects, and that's in New South Wales, under a Liberal government where we have infrastructure New South Wales. Uh, and I don't think for a moment um, that the Minister would suggest that the New South Wales government are somehow botching up their transport agenda by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the attack on Infrastructure Australia is an interesting one. The only reason I can surmise that the Minister might be uh, not so enamoured with the model is that Infrastructure Australia identified uh, Melbourne Metro Rail as this state's number one infrastructure priority. Um, all around modern um, political jurisdictions, the model of having independent assessment for infrastructure is the model that is working, and we see that in New South Wales. Uh, the Minister talked about using, utilising the resources at Public Transport Victoria. Well, they did a plan. It's called the Network Development Plan, and the Minister, and it actually recommended that Melbourne needs to build Melbourne Metro Rail for the purposes of expanding and extending our rail network. So you can't say on the one hand, let's not have an independent body, we've already got one, we're making decisions, we're doing the work. And when they do the work, ignore it, rip it up, hide it away from the public. Infrastructure Victoria, we are confident it will make the same, uh, it will have a similar impact to that of I uh, Infrastructure New South Wales and Infrastructure Australia. Um, we think it is important that we get a centre of gravity in our infrastructure projects, not just for the purposes so Terry and I don't come back here every four years, you know, having a couple of polite pot shots at each other, but because our infrastructure pipeline desperately demands it. We need it for the purposes of capital investment. We need it for the purposes of services and infrastructure. We need it to give um, certainty to those that are employing people. This is why that model has been so successful, um, both in New South Wales and in Canberra. On top of that, in a government-dominated public accounts and elect uh, uh, public accounts committee recommended the model of Infrastructure Victoria and Projects Victoria. It's been recommended by a government-dominated committee of the parliament. Labor is setting what its priorities are. We want to ensure that we've got an independent body that can identify future transport priorities along with other future infrastructure priorities and to ensure that we stop having um, four-year 
based on electoral cycle debates about what our priorities are. Our infrastructure deficit will never be reduced unless we start taking the politics um, out of some of the priority setting. Okay, Jill, we've got to get to our closing remarks, but we've got one more question before that. Uh, sorry, uh, Tony Morton, Public Transport Users Association. Um, keeping in mind that um, in peak hour, the, uh, the number of people who pass through Footscray Station in trains actually exceeds by um, a fair margin the number of people who go over the Westgate Bridge in cars. And given that um, either the, uh, the Melbourne Metro Tunnel or the Melbourne Rail Link would essentially add another three Westgate bridges worth of passenger capacity to the network, but given that there is currently fury in the community in, in Melbourne about crumbling suburban public transport systems, um, train cancellations, trains delayed, signal failures, track failures, buses that don't meet trains, trains that skip stations. Um, given this, wh where, where is the plan to, um, o over the next term of government, to build up the resilience and the capacity of our suburban public transport networks as critical infrastructure so that Melburnians aren't lying awake at night wondering about how they'll get around their city? Uh, start with Jill. Um, yeah, you can go Jill if you want. Well, um, we support investing in public transport and building Melbourne Metro Rail, a proper Melbourne Metro Rail that's going to take people to where they want to go. Um, first point. Uh, second point, um, I think it's absolutely critical that as our rolling stock, some of which will be high capacity, comes online, that will necessitate the investment uh, in signalling issues. Um, we also think it's critical that the Auditor General be given follow the dollar powers to ensure uh, that we are able to have an independent audit on how maintenance spend uh, is being conducted uh, because there are significant concerns that have been raised um, around those issues. Labor has said the government's uh, network development plan, we've said that upon coming into office we will review that, that goes to the longer term plan of where and how we expand um, our public transport system. But what we haven't got is we haven't got uh, the government haven't released a network development plan for buses. They haven't released one for trams, as the Auditor General have criticised them for. They haven't released one for the regional uh, for the regional networks either. Um, we are deeply committed to ensuring that we start investing in the building blocks of a public transport system that delivers our state world class public transport. But we're not going to over promise what we got what we can't deliver. We're starting with removing the level crossings, Mernda Rail and Melbourne Metro Rail, um, and we will fund um, future projects in future terms of government. We're not going to be like this government that is going to promise the world to get elected and then never deliver any of it. Thank you. Uh, Tony, have you forgotten what it was like under a Labor government with a public transport network in Melbourne? When we moved 132,000 people during the recent spring carnival. 40% of people who went to the races went by train. Not a single incident. I had letter after letter after letter under the former Labor government from the VRC. Remember Oaks Day? Shanks Pony people walking along the tracks to get home. The system has improved. Now, you represent people who use public transport and you would know that customer satisfaction has gone up dramatically on public transport and it's at an all-time high on the tram network. And that's simply because we've made the investment. Something like $450 million in the last budget going into asset renewal across the network. Upgrading the power supplies, overhead wiring, points, crossings, signals, and we've been doing that since we came to government. And that's why punctuality is where it is today. As I said, I left my office today, it's tracking at 95%. If seven trains makes a difference, if you believe that's what's getting Metro paid more, then you're wrong. Because it's a handful of services and it occurs if you have a fatality on the network, an accident, someone is ill, copper wire theft, a train fault, whatever, whatever. That's when the trains have to get back into position as quickly as they can for the peaks. It's monitored closely by Public Transport Victoria and I reject any claim whatsoever that that's how we've got to today with our performance on the network. The investment that we put in and our recent commitment to rolling stock, $3.9 billion to roll out a train a month from July next year, Labor's commitment is $900 million. Our commitment is just not about the people who travel, it's about the manufacturers, it's about Bombardier and it's about Alston to make sure that we can let them continue 
to build the rolling stock that they have here in Victoria. So Alstom get additional extrapolus trains to continue their workforce. Bombardier get an order for additional trams and additional velo velocity rail cars so they can continue with what they're doing. And in the meantime, Cranbourne, Packenham, Dandenong Corridor, 25 high capacity trains as part of the unsolicited bid proposal and another 75 trains to be ordered on top of that. That comes from Public Transport Victoria. That's what they're telling us we need to do, plus the new E-class trams that enable us to retire the old Z-class trams and the new trains allow us to take the old Comens trains out of the network going forward. That is a plan to build a network and make sure we've got good, comfortable rolling stock for people going forward. And as I say, your customers and the people you represent are telling me, through the customer satisfaction surveys, we like what you're doing, but just do more of it, and we will. OK, we're getting on to our closing remarks now. I do want to ask you about Tony Abbott doing you no favours by hiking the fuel excise, but I guess that's what that awkward hug was well, all that's about. Not all. <laughs> that's not all, Peter. That's a lot more. Well, thank, <laughs> thank heavens fuel prices are coming down. <laughs> we do have to get on to our closing remarks, and we're starting with you, Jill. Uh, thanks very much. Look, it's been a terrific opportunity to come here today and to um, talk and debate uh, public transport and the broader transport issues as well. But um, essentially, four years ago, um, Victorians voted for a Liberal government and they voted for them because they promised that they were going to build um, a rail line link to Doncaster, a rail link to Roeville. They were even going to put new services between Bendigo, Ballarat and Geelong. They were going to build a rail line to Avalon. Uh, they were going to fix all the public transport promises and they have failed on all of those counts. It's like the Liberal government want us to believe that the last four years did not exist. It's like they want us to trust in their political promises now that they will deliver in, you know, 20, 30 years' time if we're lucky. They don't tell you with all of their promises that they will require you to vote for them again and again and again before we'll see any manifestation of these transport, um, of these transport improvements on our system. Labor has made important commitments, particularly in public transport. We're going to remove 50 of our most congested and dangerous level crossings. We are going to transform our metropolitan rail system by building Melbourne Metro Rail. We are going to build a rail link to Mernda. We are going to keep focused on the sorts of transport investments that have the ability to fundamentally improve public transport realistically. We won't be down handing out fake newspapers or cardboard box trains to try and hoodwink people into believing that there had been a substantial improvement in our public transport system. Uh, Labor takes public transport very seriously. We want to give Victorians a choice. We hope Victorians choose investment in public transport and investment in local roads and in regional roads. Thank you very much. If I could also thank um, the Minister, who was also often very fun and delightful in sure. those debates. It has been um, <laughs> one such debate yet again. Um, and thank you very much, Peter, and to the Press Club for uh, hosting this event. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Terry. Thanks, Peter. Look, um, it should all be about track record. It should be all about whether or not you believe the government uh, that you're going to elect has got the ability to deliver the projects that they say they're going to deliver on time uh, and on budget. It should be about would the new government have the ability to hold the budget in the position that we've got it in today? Do you believe that a Labor government would be able to do that given their track record time and time again? I meet with Public Transport Victoria. I meet with the operators on a regular basis. Between us, I believe we've formed a very, very strong working relationship to improve the experience of people who travel on the public transport network. But believe you me, come November 29, if a Labor government is elected, the incoming public transport minister will, as has been the case every time in the past, take their directions from the rail, tram and bus union because that's the way it's always been and that's the way it's going to be into the future. We have had to support the operators going forward to make significant changes to a lot of the work practices. And we know very well in the past trains being pulled off the network throughout the day for a cracked lens so that the work could be carried out through the day. A lot of that work and maintenance is carried out at night. And that's now led to an improvement in the way that our 
rail network actually works. It's about who would you trust going forward given our starting position to where we are today as a government, would you trust it back in the hands of a Labor government and the rail, tram and bus union because that's exactly where it's going to head. Next year we go to a, an expression of interest for a new tender, for a new Mikey. Who would you trust to run an IT project in Victoria given the history of the former Labor government with IT projects? Given their history with Mikey, I had to clean that mess up. We had to stop Randall. Sunbury electrification project, cost overruns. Craigie Burn train maintenance facility, cost overruns. New stations built at Cadinia and Lynbrook without enough power to pull the, stage, uh, the trains away. Regional rail link, not enough money in the budget to do it. The metropolitan train radio system. I wore a pathway backwards and forwards to budget and estimates review committee asking for more money all the time to try and settle all of these claims laid against projects that were run by the former Labor government. Who do you trust to run these projects when you look at what the coalition government have been able to achieve since we've been in government? This has to be about trust. This has to be about track record. And it has to be about who is going to be open and accountable with the people in here today, the media. As I said, I've opened up the doors since I've been minister. Anybody who wants to get access to the people who run the system with me, they have open access and that's the way it would continue going forward. To me, it's unfinished business. We had a mess to clean up. We did it. We've made significant improvements to the system and the proof is out there for everybody to see. But to go forward, the growth that's going to occur will be phenomenal in both road and public transport. It's an exciting time for Victoria and we are the only state that's got the cash in the bank to do it and that's because of the work we did as a coalition government when we came to power. Thanks to the Press Club. Thank you, Jill, always a, a delight. Thank you, Peter, Mark, everybody who's come along today. It's been a pleasure. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Baker, the CEO of the Melbourne Press Club, to finish up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, Shadow Minister, Peter, for uh, an excellent debate. I, I think it's interesting to note, and I think I'm right on this point, that I don't think we've got one journalist question. We've got some fabulous questions from <laughs> people who are on the money. Uh, and uh, thank you both, and thank you for the an informative and uh, surprisingly civil encounter. Thank, thanks so much. The journalists uh, have taped everything, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're watching at home. Um, this is what we do at the Melbourne Press Club. If you like what uh, you see, uh, please think about joining us or coming to another of our events. Uh, you'll find all the details on our website for both membership and future encounters and, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our lunch in two weeks' time with the Premier. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jill. Thank you.